In some ways, the period of bleeding Kansas can be considered very short. Uh, it's often applied just to that summer fighting in uh, 1856. Um, there's a little outbreak of fighting in 1858 in southeastern Kansas, and then during the Civil War, the Kansas-Missouri border is very, very bloody. Uh, but usually when we say bleeding Kansas, we mean that summer of 1856. That's the voice of Professor Nicole Etchison explaining the time period that is known as bleeding Kansas, one of the now many affairs tearing the nation apart. This is Henry Wilson and the Civil War. We ended the last episode with Wilson looking forward to the election of 1856. The past two years had marked turning points in the future of the nation. 1854, with the Kansas-Nebraska Bill, 1855, with the breakout of violence in Kansas, and then 1856, with the attack on Senator Sumner. The question of whether the 1856 election would mark yet another turning point in the nation feared men on both sides. Before we look at the election, we need to take a closer look at the newly forming Republican Party, the group that Wilson joined after departing from the Know-Nothings. The Republican Party began to form following the passage of the Nebraska Bill. Midwestern anti-slavery Know-Nothings and Democrats agreed to fight the grip of slavery on the nation. Though primarily founded in the Midwest, anti-slavery men across the North followed the lead, and formed their own Republican coalitions. In February 1856, Republican representatives from each state met and planned to formally nominate a candidate for president, and planned for a convention in Philadelphia in June. Earlier in the year, the Know Nothings held their own convention where they nominated former President Millard Fillmore, and with most anti-slavery men now members of the Republicans, they accepted a more pro-slavery platform. In the first week of June, the Democrats held their convention, which posed a close race between Stephen Douglas and James Buchanan. In the end, the powerful and politically experienced James Buchanan secured the nomination. The Democrats wanted to compromise their way through division and secure peace between the two regions. Buchanan, a Pennsylvanian morally opposed to slavery, though he believed Southerners had a constitutional right to keep enslaved individuals. On June 17, 1856, Henry Wilson entered the first Republican National Convention in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, with the mission to nominate the first Republican presidential candidate. Wilson entered the hall with the intent to nominate John C. Fremont, an explorer and the first senator of California. Wilson also supported the other candidates up for consideration, like Sam and Chase and William Seward, though he held suspicious views of Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, John McLean, who, at the time of the election, was 71 and had been a close contender for the Whig nomination in the election of 1848. The Republicans quickly got to business and accepted a strong anti-slavery platform. At the top of the Republican agenda was the goal to reinstate the Nebraska Bill and stamp out slavery wherever the federal government could and limit the power of Southern slave owners. Though many desired it, Republicans had no plans to abolish slavery in the South, though many Southerners believed just the opposite. On the first day of the convention, Wilson spoke to roaring praise and applause. Quote, I have been more accustomed to look into the stern faces of foes than to meet the glances of friends. We are not only fighting to save Kansas, to make a free state beyond the Missouri, but we are fighting to vindicate freedom of speech in the National Congress. End quote. After some debate and organization, the convention nominated a former California senator and famed explorer John C. Fremont after the 11th ballot. They also nominated William Dayton, 
as the vice presidential nominee on the first ballot. Second on the vice presidential ballot was Abraham Lincoln. In an early, unofficial vice presidential ballot, Charles Sumner came in fifth and Henry Wilson 14th, though both men had withdrawn their names from formal consideration. Following the convention, Justice McLean charged Wilson and other convention organizers with corruption. Though it's certain that some keen political maneuvering was done behind the scenes, the charges of corruption seem to be founded more in jealousy than merit. With the Republicans choosing their nominee, the campaign kicked off with Wilson working both in public and private to organize the Republican Party in both Massachusetts and across the free states. Wilson wanted Republicans to appeal to foreigners, a stark contrast to the views of the Know-Nothing Party he was previously a part of. Following the end of the Senate session in August, Wilson went hard at work traveling the nation, giving speeches, and raising money. Wilson was a hard and furious campaigner who throughout his career was often regarded as one of the greatest campaigners of the era, starting in the election of 1840, which we covered a few episodes ago. William Lloyd Garrison later estimated that Wilson had likely given speeches to more men than nearly any other politician in U.S. history. During the 1856 campaign, Wilson spoke to crowds of tens of thousands, taking small rests to spend time with Harriet and Henry in Natick. Though most of his personal letters are lost to history, Wilson missed his family and corresponded with them frequently. Though Wilson and other Republicans fought hard in their effort to get Fremont elected, they were ultimately unsuccessful. But their second-place position marked a new era in the political party system. A party whose first presidential convention was that year had never achieved so much national success. Winning only 45% of the popular vote, the Democrat, James Buchanan, had won the close race. The Republicans and Know Nothings split the rest of the vote, with the Republicans winning 33% of the vote and the quickly fading Know Nothings winning just 22%. The Republicans now had the mission to fight the new administration, which Wilson and others regarded to be culprits of the slave power, all while continuing the great fight going on in Kansas. In October 1856, just a month before the election, Southern governors held a meeting, which many suspected was where a plan would be established to leave the Union if Republicans won, an event that was avoided with Buchanan's win, at least for the moment. Biographer Ernest McKay wrote, quote, Wilson had become, like Seward of New York, Chase of Ohio, and Lincoln of Illinois, a founder and builder of the Republican Party. Each of these men, and many others like them, had their own ambition. Each trimmed, each conformed, and sometimes they followed instead of led. Each knew their limitations, each knew the complex factors that went into leading a political party. They did not claim to be idealists or moralists, but overriding their shortcomings, they consciously combined a wide variety of social, political, and economic factions to build an organization to fight slavery. For the time being, defeat was the only reward for their efforts. End quote. In private, Wilson told Reverend T.W. Higginson that he didn't believe the Republican Party would be successful if it didn't win in the election. Though despite his private concerns about the failure of the anti-slavery contingent, he continued to stand and organize with the party. Following the election, Wilson traveled to Montreal, Canada, to be the U.S. representative to a celebration opening a railroad between the two countries. Wilson gave a speech, which was praised as being one of the best of the event. Tension in the South continued to heat as Republicans made a strong showing in the fall. Threats of secession became louder, and the calls for a divided America grew. While most threats of disunion came from the South, in January 1857, extreme Garrisonian abolitionists, including Garrison himself, held a convention in Worcester, Massachusetts, to call for the disunion of anti-slavery states. For many years, Garrisonians touted the motto, 
no union with slaveholders. Wilson rejected the notion of disunion, claiming that their activities hurt political abolition, believing that the anti-slavery cause would be advanced, <clears throat> believing that, quote, the anti-slavery cause would be advanced if some of them were ever more to keep silent, end quote. Wilson penned a letter to the disunion convention, rebuking their activities. In response, many speakers in the convention hall took their oratory charm to tear apart the senator's less radical views. The disunionists read portions of Wilson's letter at the start of the convention, stirring up much outrage. Wilson wrote, quote, I'm opposed to slavery. I want all men who are opposed to slavery to take a moderate and reasonable position, to take a moderate and reasonable position, to abandon the extreme notions which those men, Wendell Phillips and etc., entertain. Banish the Negro discussions we are having in these halls, and leave slavery in the states where the Constitution leaves it, to the care of the people of those states. I believe that when it is done, the liberal, high-minded, just men of the South, in their own time and in their own way, bring about a safe emancipation." End quote. During his speech at the convention, T.W. Byrd said, quote, The idea contained in this letter is that we are to accomplish all our anti-slavery measures by political action. God forbid that knowing the general so long as I have, I should be supposed to entertain the slightest doubt of his perfect sincerity and integrity as an anti-slavery man, but he views everything from the politician's standpoint. End quote. That was a more mild rebuke of Wilson compared to the speeches of Garrison, who charged Wilson with political ambition and hypocrisy from his early days, and Wendell Phillips, whose speech might best have been titled An Attack on Henry Wilson. To great applause, Phillips said in different parts, quote, The gist of Mr. Wilson's letter is that no possible contingency, for no possible purpose, will he allow the Union to be touched. He is not a fit leader in the anti-slavery enterprise if he lays down any such principle. When Henry Wilson goes up to the Senate of the United States, if he wishes to be a part of that government, he must vote men into office and vote money to carry on the government. And he knows, if he carries it on, he carries on the slave power. The slaveholder says that the Union is his safeguard. Mr. Wilson is for preserving it at every hazard. I like to learn from the enemy. If the slaveholder loves the Union, I hate it. The love of such a sagacious tyrant is authority enough for my hate, end quote. In learning of Garrison's claims that he has retreated from the cause of abolition, Wilson wrote to Sumner, quote, I see Garrison has read me out of the Senate. How little he knows about our position here. Is it not strange that a man who acted for freedom, often against his own apparent interests for years, who now has to go daily with a revolver in his pocket, should be accused of retreating by one who ought to have more charity? So goes the world. While Wilson likely felt the sting of these criticisms, some were fair, some not so much, he certainly didn't let them affect his work. In fact, it seems it may have pushed him to prove himself as a true friend of freedom. Wilson began his year with a trip to Kansas. Here again is Professor Nicole Etchison to fill us in on the struggle that had been happening within Kansas in the years prior to 1858. The fighting broke out in Kansas in the spring of 1856 because of the problems created by popular sovereignty and by those early elections. Um, so the crucial election that kind of sets up bleeding Kansas is the spring of 1855. It's the election of a territorial legislature. And uh, actually, the pro-slavery settlers might have legitimately won that election because it's early in the migration. People haven't gotten into Kansas, um, but they cheated. The, the Missourians crossed over the river. 
um, in droves. Um, they went, they organized in parties. They went all through the territory. There was a lot of fraud at that 1855 election. And it, there was so much fraud, it got national attention. Um, so 1855, the pro-slavery party uh, overwhelmingly won the uh, control of the territorial legislature. And to give you an idea of the scope of the fraud, the election was in March. A month before that, there had been a territorial census. In February 1855, the territorial census said that there were 2,905 voters in Kansas. Uh, the election totals for the pro-slavery candidates in the March election were five and 6,000 votes. So twice the number of voters that are actually in the territory. Uh, so you can see why this caused people to scratch their heads throughout the nation and say, if you only got less than 3,000 uh, voters, how are your candidates getting five or 6,000 vote totals? Um, well, because of this fraud. Uh, so the Midwesterners and the very small number of New Englanders who were in the territory in spring, summer of 1855, rejected this fraud, said, we can't vote. And, and some of them had actually been kept from the polls by armed Missourians. Um, and so they set up their own extra legal government, something called the Topeka Movement, because uh, they met at uh, the settlement of, of Topeka. Um, the federal government did not recognize them. The federal government, in fact, will call the Tobika movement treasonous. The federal government recognizes this pro-slavery legislature that's sitting at the territorial capital of Lecompton. Um, so right off the bat, you have in 1855, two different governments. One government that the free staters say, we really represent popular sovereignty but we can't make ourselves heard at the polls. And the other government that is the legal pro-slavery but fraudulently elected <laughs> territorial government. Um, and through 1855, 1856, there are clashes, uh, particularly surrounding Lawrence, Kansas, which is the principal New England settlement. Or if you are a Missourian, you would say that Lawrence is the principal abolitionist hellhole in Kansas territory. Uh, John Brown uh, in southern Kansas, uh, he, was, he was part of a party of free staters on their way to um, Lawrence to save Lawrence from the pro-slavery sheriff. Uh, they find out they're too late. And so Brown goes off with a, a few of his sons and his son-in-law and, and another man or two. They go off into the countryside around Pottawatomie Creek and they assassinate uh, five pro-slavery settlers. Um, and, and then at the same time, uh, although people in Kansas may not have known about it, uh, Preston Brooks beats Charles Senator Charles Sumner uh, on the floor of, of the Senate for the speech that Sumner had given on Kansas. Um, but is principally in Kansas territory, the attack on Lawrence um, and the Pottawatomie massacre that set off this guerrilla fighting. Uh, so you've got small armed bands, some of them free staters, including one led by John Brown, some of them led by pro-slavery men like Henry Titus, and they're running around the territory and they're shooting at each other. And uh, the territorial governor is utterly incompetent. He does not have the respect of the army. What happens in the fall of 1856, uh, a new territorial governor is sent in and he is a John Geary. He tells the army, I don't care if they're free state or pro-slavery, um, arrest them if they're out in the countryside shooting at each other. And the army trusts this guy uh, he has their back in the way that the previous territorial governor did not. Um, and so the army begins to shut down these guerrilla groups who are willing to shoot at each other, but less willing to shoot at the United States Army. After seeing the conditions and making tens of speeches and meeting hundreds of settlers, Wilson deemed it possible for the state to be made free and have the civil conflict between the dueling governments 
settled through a legitimate election that was planned for the fall. Wilson saw that there was support for Kansas to be a free state, though he also saw the challenge to organizing a fair and free election. Wilson pledged to free state organizers that he would raise money to support their organizing efforts. Wilson spent months going from state to state, city to city, making speeches and holding meetings to raise enough money to fund the free efforts in Kansas. Though economic trouble destabilized some of the country, Wilson was effective in raising a few thousand dollars. Chances of success seemed dull, although, with Democratic Governor Robert Walker pledging to support a fair election, victory could not be ruled out. When the October election came around, Wilson's money had paid off, in part, as a Republican was overwhelmingly elected to Congress. Though where it mattered in the determination of the slave status of the state, results showed that the people of Kansas elected a pro-slavery state legislature, a result that stunk of a manipulated election. Uh, in 1858, the issue was again the election of a, of a territorial legislature. There, there were frauds in these elections. There were two little hamlets um, in Eastern Kansas uh, that had, you know, maybe a half a dozen houses and managed to return election rolls with thousands of votes for the pro-slavery candidates. And one of those election rolls was the, the um, deputy territorial governor. Uh, he rolled it out on the floor and it went for feet. <laughs> out on the floor. And it was in alphabetical order. Adams voted before Baker, who voted before Cole. It's like, really? People come in to vote in alphabetical order? It turned out uh, that the voter roll had been copied from the Cincinnati directory. Uh, and so in 1858, the territorial governor I uh, was actually the, the assistant territorial governor because the territorial governor was out of the territory, but the assistant territorial governor said, this is clearly a fraud. I throw it out. In 1855, at those elections, the fraud was pretty well known, but the territorial officials said they could not, quote, go behind the returns, unquote. These are the certified returns we were, we were given. So even though there are thousands more votes than there are voters in the territory, these are the returns. We get a pro-slavery legislature. Uh, so the key difference in 1858 was the territorial officials who said, no, this is clearly fraud. We throw it out. The free staters win um, the election. And the pro-slavery uh, party had actually hid the original returns in a wood box uh, that was discovered and the papers were taken to the, to the territorial officials um, in Lecompton. The governor rejected any tallies with questionable results, making the legitimate majority free state, though delegates to the state constitutional convention remained pro-slavery. The pro-slavery and anti-slavery delegates agreed to compromise and make two constitutions and allow for Congress to choose which one would be the one that would be used for the state once it would be admitted. Yet another polarizing battle for Kansas was pushed on. Democrats held contrasting views surrounding which constitution should be admitted. Senator Stephen Douglas supported the free state, Topeka Constitution, but President Buchanan supported the slave, Lecompton Constitution. Wilson, conditioned to party politics, saw a moment for a coalition to be formed, though because of a lack of interest from both Republicans and Douglas Democrats, his idea for a coalition never came to bear. Though Kansas continued to dominate the rumblings of debate around slavery and the work of Wilson, there was yet another event of outrage to divide the nation. In March of 1857, the Supreme Court announced their decision in the case of Scott v. Sanford. The case revolved around a man named Dred Scott. Dred Scott was an enslaved man born in Virginia in 1799.
The deed to Scott's enslavement was transferred many times throughout his life, though his final owner brought him from Missouri, where slavery was legal, to Illinois and the Wisconsin Territory, where slavery was illegal. Dred Scott spent time living in the Free Territory and married Harriet Robinson, and married Harriet Robinson, having two daughters with her. Scott's master brought him back to Missouri before dying. Scott's deed was transferred again to his master's wife, who had little need for an enslaved person, and moved to Massachusetts, leaving Scott in Missouri. Scott was able to bring a case to the Missouri state courts, arguing that because he was brought to a free state, he was automatically free, because of the legality of slavery in that state. The Missouri courts ruled against Scott, and he petitioned the federal courts, eventually having his case heard in the Supreme Court. In a decision that further engulfed the nation in its growing division, Chief Justice Roger Taney ruled in his opinion that Scott was not free. The court ruled that 1. Blacks could not be citizens of the United States and therefore did not have the same rights and privileges as white citizens, essentially nullifying Scott's entire petition because he had no right to file it, and 2. That the federal government could not regulate slavery in the states and that the entire Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional. The decision essentially affirmed the beliefs of Garrisonians that the Constitution affirmed and supported slavery. Wilsonites, that's men of Wilson's circle, believed that the case was proof that the slave power had engulfed the federal government and had distorted the founding documents to be pro-slavery. Wilson later wrote, quote, that instead of even-handed justice, was its most shameless prostitution, and judges, instead of being just, ruling in the fear of God, gave unmistakable evidence that their rulings were rather given in fear of the utmost omnipotent slave power, and nowhere was this ever more apparent and distressing than it was than what was familiarly termed the Dred Scott case." End quote. In culmination of the Dred Scott case, Kansas and the beating of Sumner, the North was becoming more passionate with the fight against slavery as the South crept one step closer to disunion. In today's episode of Henry Wilson and the Civil War, we covered the election of 1856, Henry Wilson's work in forming the Republican Party, we examined some Garrisonian criticisms of Wilson, and Wilson's organization efforts for a free Kansas. We wrapped it up by looking at the infamous Dred Scott case. At this point in the history, the nation was moving at a steady speed towards disunion. These are all key moments in leading to the Civil War, and will be very important once we get to the Civil War. A special thank you to Professor Nicole Etchison for helping present the story of Bleeding Kansas. If you're interested in Henry Wilson's life and want to do more reading or look at some pictures, go to henrywilsonhistory.com, my website dedicated to all information on Henry Wilson. I look forward to talking with you on the next episode of Henry Wilson and the Civil War.